Hello and welcome to The Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a business growth expert where I help business owners grow and scale to create wealth and freedom. Today, I have an awesome guest. His name is Richard Canfield, and he is the co-host of the Wealth Without Bay Street podcast, Amazon best-selling author, authorized infinite banking practitioner, business owner, real estate investor, father, husband, and all-around nice guy. And in 2009, Richard's life changed completely when he read the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Unlock the Infinite Banking Concept by R. Nelson Hash, Nash. And he knew this was what he had been looking for for all of his life. Nelson Nash became his friend and mentor. And Richard and his team now teach his powerful message of financial hope and control to North Americans. As an Amazon best-selling author, podcast host, and authorized in infinite banking practitioner, Richard is passionate about putting people in the driver's seat of their financial life and creating durable, dependable, generational wealth. And they work with families, business owners, and real estate investors to strategize how they can keep more of their hard-earned money that flows through their hands over a lifetime. Welcome, Richard Canfield, and thank you for being on my show. Yeah, excited to be here, man. It's going to be a blast. I can't wait to talk about uh, everything under the sun and add some value to your amazing listeners. Definitely. It's going to be awesome for everyone watching and listening today. So first, you're a successful entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, just please introduce yourself by telling us a bit more about you and your journey. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to go way back to the beginning and maybe some people can relate to this. I grew up in a small town, small community, and it was a farming community. And uh, we had, a, we had a, a home-based business. Our home-based business was septic trucks and portable toilets. So, you know, all those little buildings at the job site and, you know, at the rodeo and all the events. Well, I used to build those and then deliver them all over uh, Western Canada to the area that we lived. And I had to do everything in between that came with that particular job. So I grew up in that life. I used to say that I was the heir to the portable toilet kingdom of Camrose, Alberta, small little town. And, uh, you know, going through that experience in my youth, what happened was kind of like what Robert Kiyosaki talks about in the different quadrants. We had a business, but we were really all in the S quadrant. And the S stands for several things, self-employed. Sometimes it stands for Superman, like, because you have to be, wear all the hats and do all the things. And I really felt that that's where we were at. And so I grew up in that environment of work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. And then when you're done doing all that work hard some more, <laughs> that was kind of the model of the world that I understood. And I thought that working hard would just magically translate into some kind of success in my life. That's the lessons that I thought I, I took away from my youth. And there was also a lot of frustration because of how hard we were working all the time. Sometimes tensions would build and those tensions would circle back to things and topics like money. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Money topics in the household aren't always fun to discuss, whether it's hearing your parents talk about it, talking about it with your siblings, you talking about it with your parents. There's always some kind of dynamic and it would tend to bring up stress in the situation and just like a tension that you could feel. And I was the one who, being the youngest, I actually became a really big saver. I recognized that I always wanted to have access to money. So I used to put money into a, a can that I had, and it was my own personal bank. And I would even have my siblings or my parents even borrow money from me, and I would get them to write IOUs, and I would store them so I would track it. But I didn't understand compound interest. I didn't understand the power of charging interest. And so I didn't recognize that I could bring friends back with the money when they paid me back. I didn't really learn that lesson until much later on in life. And so those early experiences led me to recognize that when I went out on my own into the real world, it wasn't long after I left, left home that a copy of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a, a guy you know who, who wanted to invest in me as a person said, Richard, let me buy a copy of this book for you. It really helped me out and changed my life. And I read that book and I realized there's a whole world of opportunity out there that we could do things differently. I immediately recognized the quadrants and like, oh my God, this is exactly what I just spent the last 10 years of my life doing in that Superman role. I want to move over to this, you know, investor business owner quadrant. And so really I've been on that, that track of figuring out how to best do that over the last 20 years of my life to be in an environment where now I can have a durable, successful business where I have a team, I have people around me. So I get to work in my unique ability and do the things that I love to do 
And I, I get to have other people who love to do things and they get to do what they love to do. And the things they like to do aren't the things I like to do. So that creates a lot of capacity and a lot of freedom, uh, some time freedom, but also freedom of money and freedom of relationship. And so the ability to have that, again, it was a long journey, but creating that environment was all inspired by Rich Dad, Poor Dad as a book. And then years later, when I got the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, that's when the rubber really hit the road. That's where I realized all the things I'd been learning about real estate investment, about uh, financial empowerment, um, about uh, personal development, I could intersect all those things together with the knowledge in that one book. And I could create so much more potential and possibility on my financial life by gaining more control on my cash flow as it came into my life and it wanted to exit. I could intercept something in the middle and be able to harness the potential of that money for more than my own lifespan. And that was an eye-opening experience for me. And it really started to change the trajectory of how I was going to go about helping people for the rest of my life. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. What a powerful story um, that you shared there. And uh, I can definitely relate from the uh, sort of working hard element growing up um, as well as, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, um, you know, he was one of the, the first money books that I read at the start of my business journey that really got me thinking outside the box and, and, you know, rescripting my money beliefs and things like that, that we don't normally get taught by in standard, you know, working class families, right? Um, like you were mentioning. So I can definitely relate um, to a lot of that stuff. And I'm looking forward, he's about to come here for his final tour in Australia, New Zealand. Um, so just as we're recording this right now, so he's probably already, um, you know, come uh, by the time this this comes out. But um, yeah, it's going to be powerful. Looking forward to meeting him and um, yeah, you know, giving some thanks as well. Um, you know, it looks like it's impacted us and and hopefully I'm sure a lot a lot of people around the world too. So, so let, let's get into it now. And, um, you know, there's this infinite banking concept, right, that, that you talk about here. And some people are probably going, what is this? What are you talking about, uh, Richard? You know, so um, do you want to um, first tell us what is this concept um, that, that you, you mean? Yeah, so um, I mean, every aspect of my life has been fundamentally impacted by this book called Becoming Your Own Banker. So the, the two books, again, if anyone wants to, I recommend you read is the purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the black book, Becoming Your Own Banker, two fundamental things that are real game changer, in my opinion. Um, the concept is actually very simple. A lot of people like to complicate it. But fundamentally, if you think about it, we all bank every single day. You, you can't, money has to move throughout the economy from me to you, you to someone else, you to the grocery store, you to the car guy, you to the mortgage guy. Money is always transactionally moving in our hands in some way. What we do is we utilize someone else's bank to, to, to become the function of warehousing money when we hold it and before it goes out to go do something else. So it, it functions to handle some of that transactional nature plus a holding tank, a holding facility. Now, out in Australia, I would imagine you guys have like carports or garages. You know, you park a vehicle inside of a garage. Yeah. Uh, well, here up in Canada, we need to do that pretty frequently because we have this nasty thing called snow that we get. And so it's really nice when you get to park your car in a garage. A lot of people, though, they just use their garage as an extra storage facility for all their junk. And they park their car on the concrete outside. So a lot of people do things a little bit differently. But just imagine for a moment, you're in your car, you get in your car, you go to the grocery store, you go to you go to work, you go to a job, you go to your office, you go to take the kids to soccer practice, football, rugby, you come back home, you're always returning the car to the warehouse, the garage, okay? It's a storage facility for your car. Your car goes and does stuff and it always returns back home to its resting location. Does that make sense? Yep. Banking is the same way. We have a storage facility where our money goes to. New money comes in, it goes into the storage tank, and then it goes out and it does stuff. We invest money. That money comes back in, it goes into a storage tank, and then we hopefully invest more of it. So it's in and it's out, and it's in and out of the storage tank. We use someone else's bank to perform that function. Does that make sense? That's what everyone's accustomed to in the world. What Nelson's book teaches us, Becoming Your Own Banker, is to slowly and incrementally transition that storage warehouse to an entity that you own and control. So you're reducing your need and dependency on the third-party banks for your saving and your borrowing business, and you're transitioning it to a new entity, a new financial entity, where you now control that saving and borrowing capacity, and you can optimize the efficiency of your money for the rest of your life. That's fundamentally what we're doing. It's not very complicated. It's just a new way of thinking. 
And what we do, and primarily in North America, although there are ways to do this in other parts of the world as well, because I know you have a global show, the fundamental principles that Nelson Nash teaches us can be implemented by anybody. Whether you're using the insurance vehicle that we use here in North America, or you're using a different method, the same principles can apply. In, in North America, we use a type of life insurance, a dividend paying whole life insurance contract. And it's very similar to, I, I equate it to like a house. And here'd be a great example. You probably have a ton of real estate investors that listen to this. Maybe they're, they're business owners that invest in real estate on the side. That's pretty common. But everyone understands the basics of a house. You buy a house, it's got some land in a building, and it it's worth some money. It's worth value. That's the market price. Typically, there's a mortgage or some debt on, on, the prop, on the property. Does that make sense? That's pretty common. So whatever the mortgage is, let's say the mortgage is here and the value of the house is here, everything above that mortgage up to the value is equity. That equity is capital that you have ownership over. You, you, you control that capital. If you sold the property, you transfer that capital into cash, and then you get to spend it to do something else. Does that make sense? Yep. Very simple, very basic. So everyone's familiar with that process. Now, if you own the property and the property goes up in value, you increase equity. And if you own the property and you pay down the mortgage, the balance of the mortgage goes down, you also create equity. So paying it down creates equity and increasing the market price. Both of those things creates an arbitrage effect. All right. If you could tap into that equity at will with no questions asked, without having to go and see a third party bank and ask permission fill in Mickey Mouse paperwork, hand over your business financials, do credit checks and do a whole bunch of stuff in order to get access to a third party bank's money. That would be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? If you could just at will tap into the equity of that property and then go and use it to invest in a new business, to invest in marketing for your business, to invest in podcast production, to invest in a new piece of real estate or to go on a family vacation. And then you took new money that you're earning, new income, and you use it to replenish that pile of equity that you, you, you accessed. Does that make sense? So you tapped into some of it, you used it. You have new money coming in, you replace the value so that you can tap into it again for the next time you need to do something. You follow my logic? Yep. If you could do that with a piece of real estate, and to some degree you can, then you would have effectively a banking system that you created, which isn't using a third-party bank primarily. The problem with a piece of real estate is you don't control the market and the market price. Economic factors that you don't control and po geopolitical factors that you don't control have a direct impact onto the market value of that property. So we need to use a vehicle that allows for constant and continued appreciation without the impact of geopolitical and market risk uh, for forces that you know uh, impact it, where you have a guaranteed known event that's going to happen in the future. And we want to be able to have access to the equity that's created in that contract. So we do that through the use of this insurance vehicle because it has fundamental characteristics that allow you to contractually access money whenever you want on demand. It's a very peaceful and stress-free way of financial life. So really what we're doing is we're changing where you save and borrow money from a third-party institution to saving and borrowing money from an insurance company that you now co-own because you participate in their profits as a co-owner. That's fundamentally the difference that we're teaching people how to do. And then we work on our mindset so that we can incorporate generational thinking into that lifelong process. Yeah, nice. Awesome. I love that. Um, very there. And I've got, um, it's very interesting to me here, um, you know, being uh, not something that I'm normally used to, um, you know, hearing about, and I'm sure a lot of people here as well. So how, how much of this, because like normally, like, for example, when you go to a bank, right, with a property, they might let you borrow 80%, maybe 90% if it's a particular lender or something like that, you know, like for the value of, of the, what the property is in to put something else. Is that a similar thing with this policy where you can only sort of take out a certain percentage of it and, and leave something in there? And then how does that sort of work so that, yeah, that, you know, you, you're, you're able to, I guess, maximize it without, you know, doing something wrong? Really good question. And so let, let's go back to our property example. You're exactly right. In, in general, most areas of, I mean, maybe not all areas of the globe, but certainly in North America and most westernized nations, 
typically you're able to borrow around 80% of the loan to value. So whatever the appraised value of the property is, whatever the, the, the official validated market price is, and you need to pay someone to go and validate that market price, right? Uh, an appraiser typically does that. And you may or may not like the appraisal, but the bank will take it regardless of what your feelings are. Does that make sense? Okay, so you don't have any control in that environment either. And then you will be able to borrow roughly 80%, but you have to fill in all the paperwork. You got to jump through the hoops. You got to do the credit check. It shows up on your credit report. There, The bank is going to determine the payment structure on that loan. They're going to turn the interest rate, the payment structure, the payment time frame, and you don't get to control any of those variables either. So all the control features are at the bank level, not at the U level. Does that make sense? If we redirect that and we position it in this environment, you can access 90% of whatever the contract value is. It's called the cash value on any given day with zero questions asked. With some institutions, you could it's, you log into an account and you click a button to request a loan. It's that fast. Or you send in one piece of paper and within a couple of business days, you know, four to 10 business days, money is direct deposited into your bank account. Okay, there are no questions or requirements for a repayment. And so if if you had an outstanding loan then and to a to an asset that you own and control that's growing in value, if you don't have a repayment structure, what could happen is that loan could grow a little bit if you're not accountable. So it's important that as the banker, the person who is the banker, you have to create those rules and you have to have the right mindset. So if you don't have the right mindset, you could actually create an additional problem down the road. So we spend a lot of our time in that category, teaching people how to think through the utilization of their own money, okay? So if you're if you're used to someone else being the banker, you now have to learn the skill of being your own banker so that you can develop the right habits in place. Does that make sense? So as you're returning capital into the pool, the the, the loan balance goes down and the, and the value is increasing every single day. So the next time you need to go access money, you can access every dollar you repaid plus more for the next thing you need to do. That's the way the system works. And over time, it's very much like building a brand new business or buying a long-term buy and hold piece of real estate. You might not have access to every dollar you put in right away, but once that machine gets moving, it becomes ever more efficient. And it gets to the point where every time you put a dollar in, it gives you a dollar 20. The next year you put a dollar in, it gives you a dollar 30. The next year you put a dollar in, it gives you a dollar 40. And you can access 90% of that extra dollar to go operate in some other area of your life. That's the power of collateralization. And because we're not interrupting the growth of money, which would hap what happens with most people, they build up a money, a savings account. They build it up, they build it up, they build it up, they build it up. Then they need to go buy something or invest in something. And boom, that account value drops like a hot potato. And you can't earn on that balance anymore because you got rid of the money. You moved it into something else. You bought a car, you bought a computer, you paid for a wedding, you paid for your property, you paid taxes. You know, I don't know about you, but the government seems to have no sense of humor about me paying my taxes. They make it a requirement every single year and that money goes to them and then I can't earn on it anymore. That's how my life used to be, but not anymore. I take the same money that I know I'm going to have to pay my tax bill with and I now put it into my system and then I borrow from my system to pay the tax bill. So my money that went to the original tax bill actually went to grow my family's legacy before the government ever got their hands on it. Does that make sense? So I'm able to work with the dollar more and over a longer period of time because I changed my behavior, not because I invested any money. It's all about behavior. Yeah. Awesome. Love that. Um, deep dive. And I guess a couple of more things on this is number one, it sounds like you reduce a lot of risk you know, like anything with a structure, right? Like that you create uh, rather than have it in your, you know, your personal names or things like that, um, which will be great. And I'm interested also around like the transfer because you talk about like, you know, generational wealth, right? And this is what we want to be doing for our family is how does that work then, um, you know, with that to reduce the risk and then obviously transfer that to then, you know, for future generations. I'm going to give you an example. So imagine for a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll play on the real estate card a little bit more. So imagine for a moment you owned 45 properties, okay? It could be single family residential houses or whatever. You owned 45 of them. And each one of those properties you owned outright, free and clear. There was no debt, no mortgage on them whatsoever. 
and you could access 90% of the equity on any given day for anything you wanted to use. They're going up in value and they're producing a cash flow. Okay, so sounds pretty good so far, right? Now, at some point in time, we're going to be talking about you and talking about me in the past tense. That means we've graduated. We're not here anymore. All right. We, we, our time on planet earth is over. Makes sense. So when that day happens, a sequence of events are going to transpire. All of the assets that you have in most countries need to be sold or are considered sold on that day, even though they haven't physically been sold, mathematically they're sold. And the, the localized government or the, or the federal government is going to charge you taxation on that value. Does that make sense? And it varies country by country, but in general, that's kind of how it goes. So imagine we have these 45 properties and now rather than having to pay tax on a capital gain and having to deal with your family selling all those properties, there's an automatic sale that's initiated at the highest ever recorded value. The money and the equity automatically passes tax-free no, no government gets their hands on it whatsoever to the next generation. You choose who it goes to before you died. Okay. Now you have total control over all that value. And you also bypass probate, which again, varies by company, uh, by country, whether they charge probate costs or estate costs. So imagine for a moment, instead of all 45 of those properties selling only 17 sold and the 28 remaining properties are still in, they're still there and they're still growing today. So why did I use 45? Why did I only sell 17 and why did I keep 28? These are important questions. Do you mind if I share why? Definitely. This is a real example. This is the example of R. Nelson Nash who wrote this book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Nelson, when he passed away in March of 2019, uh, six years ago, five years ago today or, or almost to the day, he was age 88, 88 revolutions around the sun. When Nelson passed away, he had 45 life insurance contracts that he still had. At one time he had 49, but he had a few death claims along the way. He still had 45 uh, properties by the way of contract, not properties by the way of physical brick and mortar buildings. Do you see the difference? Contracts can still be considered property in, in the financial realm. Those 45 insurance contracts, he owned and controlled them, but only 17 of them was he the person that was the life insured individual. So when Nelson passed away, 17 properties or, or death benefit checks tax-free were passed on to the people he loved and cared about the most. 28 insurance contracts are still in force today, even though he's been gone for over five years. Does that make sense? And over that five-year time frame, all of those have still grown. And the remaining family members who now own those contracts can still access 90% of whatever is accumulating there to do other finance family business, buying rental properties, paying off mortgages, buying cars, going on vacation. The things that they want to do, they can continue to do because Nelson set it up one generation before. And he's created perpetual motion on his life's income and utilization of money to cascade well beyond his own lifespan. There are very few things, nothing else I've ever heard of on planet earth that can really truly create that environment and not with the simplicity that we can do it. People think you got to be rich to get into the banking business. Nelson Nash taught us that that is not the case. You can accomplish the same thing that a regular brick and mortar bank does you just need to do it at the microcosm level of your personal economy. You start small and you build as you go. Yeah, awesome. Love that, mate. Uh, you love the generational, you know, wealth talk and and how he's you know set that up and and yeah, really massive. Um, so you know, I remember having chats with my parents about things. I'm like, hey, if you set things up in a particular way, it'll help me. It might not help you right now, but it'll help me later. You know, my my sister and and everything like that. Um, you know, so important. I think is is you know thinking about the future. Um, because yeah, there's all these taxes and, uh, we all love to pay the least amount of tax possible legally. Um, of course, which, uh, which is always important, uh, where we can I like how you put that legally in there real quick. legally, of course. Well, it was funny. One, one of the big successful guy, um, that I interviewed went to his house. Um, you know, George Cooker said, he said that governments spend money and businesses make money. 
just remember that right so you know like how well are they spending the money it's not like a business they just spend oh our budget is blown out or things like this and that's our tax money right that that we give them whereas a business owner you're like hey how do i get the most out of this money that i've got here how do i maximize it it's a very different type of mindset so that's why you know i think if we can do it legally without giving them as much maybe they have to be a little bit more like a business owner um and you know being able to do it more effectively in how they spend their money it's funny you say that because Nelson, often people would ask Nelson what he did. And he would say, ah, I'm an unpaid tax collector <laughs> because as a business owner, we collect taxes and then we remit them to the government authority. So if you, if you, if you recognize a lot of people don't understand this, but I think this is a really critical observation that people should be aware of. The consumer pays for everything. I don't care if it's your groceries, if it's your, your home and auto insurance, your property taxes, your car your fuel, the fuel that you put in the car, the petrol, whatever, you pay for everything. There's taxes on those things. And the cost of the taxes that the business pays, the business doesn't pay those taxes. They are collecting the taxes and they're charging you by increasing prices so that they can make a profit. If they can't make a profit without covering the taxes, then they're not going to be in business. So they have to have profit or else they go out of business, which means all the taxes that they collect you, the consumer, are paying for them. So the consumer pays for everything. It's the, it's the fundamentals of economics. And when we get really clear that we, at the individual level, pay for every single thing that we, we utilize, including the government services through the various means that they collect them. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, those business owners and the you know, big corporations, they're, they're happy to say that they're, they're you know, bad, evil corporations sometimes. Like, hey, man, they got to collect the money to do the services. It's the only way that thing works. It, they're collecting it from you so that they can provide the thing that you want. And they also have to appease the government or else they can't stay in business. Yeah, definitely. Love that, man. Love those extra little points there. And um, I love what you talk about mindset as well and, and the behavior side of things. And I'm really big on this because you can teach the same people, the same knowledge, you know, strategies, tactics, and tools. You get a lot of different results because of the mindset. Um, so it needs to be with it, right? So you're really upskilling yourself. And I know a big part of this about what you talk about is about the Colby A index um, of, of looking at this and understanding how we work, you know, as humans as well. So do you want, I'd love for you to share yeah, more about, um, you know, this index and, and how it uh, it will help us. Yeah. Ho hopefully some of your listeners will be familiar with it. If you're not, I would encourage everyone to, you know, uh, go to Colby, K O L B E.com Colby.com. And uh, it was created by a lady named Kathy Colby. And uh, it, it, to me, it's been really liberating. And what I mean by that is when I first learned about the Colby Index and I did it, it was probably in around maybe 2013, so roughly 10 years ago or so. And it was the first time where I felt like, oh, wow, I'm not a crazy lunatic after all. I actually am a normal person. It's just that my degree of normal is very different than everyone else's degree of normal. And, you know, in the world, you go through life, you go through careers, experiences, you have people, maybe a boss or whatever, and, and, and they're telling you to do things a certain way. And you inherently know that that way doesn't work for you. You have your own way of doing things and you want to instinctually do it your way. But sometimes you're inside of a machine or the mechanics of a machine, a, 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 a corporation or a structure that doesn't allow you to do it your way. And so that comes down to instinct. So the Colby index isn't a personality assessment. It's not like DISC or, you know, one of these other things. And those are all great. I, nothing wrong with those things. Colby identifies your instinctual way of getting stuff done. How do you actually accomplish things in the world? And for me, when I first received that and I got to go through it, it was absolutely fascinating to me because I'm like, oh, I do all of these things. And absolutely, this makes total sense to me. But someone else that I know that, you know, I start a process by brainstorming. Then I try to figure out what are all the other things that we could do outside of what we just came up with. And then what kind of tools and things will we need to be able to make that a reality? And then I might find out who can help put it into a system. And after that's all said and done, then I'll say, okay, now that we've got that all figured out, what's a totally different way that we could do it? So I'll explore all of the different variables of how we might get something done. Whereas a lot of people want, hey man, just give me the checklist. I just want to go through the checklist. You know what? We don't have a checklist. Don't worry. I'm the person I want to build the checklist. Let me build the checklist. 
So people operate in these different ways and we have an instinctual way of going about attacking a project or a problem or creating a solution to something. So the more that you double down on those instinctual gifts and you have true clarity on how you go about getting things accomplished in the world, you can take your frustrations when things aren't going the right way and you can minimize them. You can get more clear on how you can get more speed out of your own effort because you're not getting bogged down by things that would normally frustrate and bother you. So the more that you can clarify that, it doesn't mean you're not going to do some of those things. Everyone's going to have to do a degree of them. But the more you hone in on what you're naturally gifted at doing in an instinctual fashion, the easier it is to say, oh, over here, there, there's Bob and there's Mary. I recognize that they're good at doing this and this. And that's an area that I really kind of suck at. They might be a natural fit to come in and join forces with me so that together the rising tide lifts all boats. That's the power of getting really clear on your instinctual action modes. Yeah, awesome, man. Love that. And uh, I noticed that uh, for those that are watching on the video, uh, next to your name, you have these numbers 3297, right? Which is quite interesting. So, and, and I believe this is uh, related to Colby. So, uh, do you want to share us a bit more about what these numbers mean and, and I guess how it's relevant for us as well? Sure, absolutely. So, so Colby measures things in, in three bars and it's on a scale of one to 10. And there's no good or there's no bad. There's no high or there's no low. There just is the reality of your instinctual way. So the first one, mine is a three, and it's called fact finder. It has to do with how you gather and then share information. So it's not that you gather a lot of facts or you don't gather a lot of facts. It's the way in which you gather it and also share it combined. So for me, I'm low on the scale. So my way is to gather a lot less facts and to simplify information so that I can relate it to other people. So that's what that means for me. Whereas if someone was higher on that, they would probably want to get more research done. They would want to have more detail oriented stuff. And then they might comprise it in a different way than I would do it. Number two is about, it's called follow through. So the second bar is called follow through. And I'm a two on a scale of one to 10, I'm a two. Follow through is about how you organize. So how you organize information, how you organize your physical world, your physical realm, organizing in lots of different ways, maybe how you organize your mind. So it's about how you organize in general. My way of doing things is to adapt. So I'm not very good at organizing things in an orderly fashion. If I was really high on that scale, I would probably have everything in a sequential order. I would know where things are really well. I would probably have a very clean office. It looks really good right here in the video, but down below around me here, it's total chaos, man. I can tell you it's complete chaos. And my wife doesn't even want to come into this room because she doesn't, you know, she like freaks out as soon as she sees what I got going on here. Is that right? But right here from the table up, it's all business. So that works for me, but I, I need to have things readily available in my physical realm so I can access them quickly. That helps me. It seems chaotic to other people, but it actually helps me get more done because it's in my instinctual nature. Does that make sense? So something that I used to be, used to seem frowned upon and I was thought, oh, Richard, why do you always do this? Well, now I can say, well, the reason I do this is because these three reasons actually help me be more efficient and effective. And it allows me to power through stuff faster than most other people. So my way works because it's my instinctual way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. The third bar is an area they call quick start. And so on a scale of one to 10, I'm a nine quick start, which is how you deal with risks and uncertainty. So if you're low on the scale, you're more likely to be, um, you're, you're probably not going to reach rash judgments. You're going to be, you want to get all the information. You want to slow things down. You want to make sure you have the information before we make a clear decision. You need to have lots of information to make the decision. Um, you want to, you want to minimize risk. Okay. If you're high on the scale, you're more likely to take on risk. You're more likely to make decisions very quickly. And you may even be a little bit more animated as you can see I am to this degree. So for me, what that means is my way of doing things is to innovate rather than to stabilize. So low on the, on the scale is to stabilize. High on the scale is about innovation, okay? Again, there's no bad or good on either of these categories because everybody has, you know, I look at all of these as a superpower doesn't matter where you're on the scale. It's a superpower if you understand how to read and interpret it. And the last bar, uh, I'm a seven, which is called implementer. Implementer isn't your ability to implement things. It's about how you deal with the physical world and tangible things. 
So physical space and tangibles. So my way of doing things is to protect. So I like quality materials. I like to make sure I have durable things around me, things that will work. I don't like it when things break very well. And if they break, I like to fix them. And I'm actually very tactile. I'm very physical and I own a lot of tools. If someone is low on that scale, like if they're say a one, two or a three, my first question is, let me guess, you don't own any tools or if you do, you have one multi-tool screwdriver and you don't know where it is, right? So that gives you some context. Whereas for me, I have a lot of tools and I like tools. I find them engaging. In fact, because I spend all my time on Zoom and doing fun stuff like, like what you and I are doing today, I don't get a chance to really break out my tools very often. So about twice a year, I go stir crazy and I need to go and do some kind of a household project where I can grab some power tools and some saws and I can get really physically engaged in something and I can get that need, that instinctual need out of my system. So it happens in like batches and because I know it's going to happen, usually about twice a year, my wife can be prepared for it. I can be prepared for it. You know, what used to happen in, in, the old, in my old world is that I, I would be overcome with the need to do those things and not realize why. And then it would interfere with my calendar when I'm supposed to be doing other things. But I had this burning urge and need to go and get my hands dirty into something. And I couldn't realize why I had to overcome that. But I had to because it's part of my natural gift. So I need to be able to utilize that energy or else it builds up and it creates problems in other areas of my life. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for that um, in-depth breakdown. It sounds really cool. And I can definitely relate to the stuff all over the desk <laughs> with my wife coming in the room, but I'm like, I know where it is, but don't worry. Why is this over here? It's like, just leave it there. It's for me for the, to look at later. So um, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. It's so interesting. And, and I can see how this could be very powerful um, from the instinctual level, especially when you're working in a business, when you're working in a team and you're understanding what different people are doing, because some people might be implementing more, right? Into what they want to do. Some people might be more of the innovation strategy side of things. And if you can get people, you know, in their role, as an, as an example, then everyone's working where they want it. They're enjoying it more, um, you know, and everything like that. And um, yeah, not just doing things one way, doing it the way that that works um, best for that person and in the team function. Um, so I love, yeah, really powerful. You you can create speed and efficiency and you can also create happier people because they're not forced to do things that are, that are literally not natural to them. And so, yeah, it, it, they're, they'll naturally be happier in their role. And the fact that you can sense that and put them in that right role, it's going to amplify their ability and it's going to create more uh, capacity for the organization to grow because people are doing more of the things that they're intending to do. Um, it can be very liberating, truly. Yeah, love that. I'll definitely be delving more into that myself and uh, recommend that for others as well. Sounds very, very cool. And I know you've got a book um, called uh, Cash Follows the Leader. Um, uh, so I'd love to hear yeah, more about it and how we can get it as well. Yeah, so it's Cash Follows the Leader, Uninterrupted Daily Growth with High Cash Value Insurance. Um, it's a quick read. It's designs that you can read it on a short flight, you know, so, uh, you know, like Chicago to Toronto, uh, kind of an idea, um, you know, maybe not geographically relevant to everyone on listening to the call, but, you know, we have a couple of uh, images and stuff in there. So people can, uh, you know, recognize like a visual connection to certain concepts that we have. I have a case study in here of one of my clients based in uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, husband and wife with uh, two young kids. And I show an example of them having a policy system and taking a passive income off of that in, re in a retirement stage. I don't like the word retirement, but passive income later on. Kicking the bucket and then refilling the tank for their young kids. And then those young kids also taking a passive income down the road. So it's about a 101-year case study that we have in this, in this short little book. And it teaches people how to, some examples of how to implement this process of becoming a banker in their life. And it also gets to the core of how these contracts, these insurance contracts actually grow over time. When you understand the dynamics, it becomes very, very simple. Um, and so, you, you know, your, your listeners can get a copy of that book for free if they want. They can go to cashfollows.com. That's cashfollows.com. And they can download an example right there. Or even if it's easier, if you're more of a visual learner and you don't want to read on a PDF, you might prefer like a video. It's just more my style. Uh, my learning style works like that. You can go to... Uh, uh, learnibc.com, learnibc.com, and you can watch a webinar there to explain how this whole process works. Pretty simple. 
Yeah, awesome. Sounds very cool. I look forward to uh, yeah delving more into that, mate. And um, yeah, it's been a very powerful episode now of, of what you shared with us uh, about you know really taking control of our um, financial well being and future generations. Um, you know as well as um, how we do things instinctually um, there, which is really important, right? Um, for ourselves as well as you know with working with teams in business and and other people around us too. And I guess as we're starting to wrap up here today, uh, what one key piece of advice would you like to give to all the entrepreneurs watching and listening today? Uh, if I were to boil it down, um, as much as we can make book recommendations, I think that's great. I, I would circle it back to Colby or, or something like it. Take the time as early as you can to invest in understanding you, who you are and what you're capable of. You might internally know some stuff, but if you can externally have it validated for you, external validation through something like Colby, uh, Clifton Strength Finders, uh, a disc profile, things of that nature, you can really get clear on how you're best able to interact yourself into the world around you and get more out of your own effort. I believe the more you do that, the more potential to increase income you have, the more opportunities will open up for you, the happier that you will be. And, and the ripple effect of all those things is going to cascade through all of your relationships, including the relationship with your spouse, and your children. So the sooner you double down on recognizing who you are and what you're about, what you're good at and capable to do, utilizing some of these third party elements, it'll really amplify your potential. That's my opinion. Yeah, love that. Completely agree, mate. Very, very powerful. And um, yeah, we connected through our networks. So I learned about your awesome journey from, you know, um, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad to then reading the book, you know, Becoming Your Own Banker, Unlock the Infinite Banking Concept by uh, Nelson Nash, um, to now teaching, uh, you know, this powerful message as an authorized infinite banking practitioner, uh, really to helping people take their um, money and wealth to that next level. Um, awesome guy, so knowledgeable. You've shared so much with us today. I'm sure you continue to help families, uh, business owners and real estate investors strategize they can keep more of their hard-earned money that flows through their hands over a lifetime. Very grateful that we connected. I look forward to working with you. So Richard, how can people find you and get in contact with you? Um, uh, really simple is uh, we have our podcast, Wealth Without Bay Street. Bay Street is the equivalent of Wall Street in Canada, although our, our podcast is uh, more North American based. Um, that's an easy way. Again, uh, that book, cashfollows.com, you can download that. They'll probably circle you back to Richard in there. Um, or learnivc.com is another great way to do that. So all those will circle back to Richard in some way. And, uh, you know, we love helping people and we love sharing this message. And we love being able to connect with business owners just like yourself and coaches who recognize the value of life is a team sport if we understand that we don't have to go it alone. And then we can open ourselves up to the power of, of coaching and the people around us who all provide some measure of mentorship in different areas of your life. Um, we're just happy that we can serve in this one area of people's lives. Yeah, I love that. Really, really powerful. Definitely check out Richard there, um, you know, with the uh, the book and, um, you know, the podcast and everything else like that. Um, you know, so much value today and I'm sure there will be more and completely agree about the coaching mentoring. Um, you know, it's uh, that's what really gets us to that next level. Um, and that's why, you know, the biggest sports stars in the world and everyone have a coach um, to push them to that next level, as well as um, get there a lot quicker um, in what we're doing so we can uh, enjoy that life, right? And what we're wanting to do, like you talked about with us today, mate. So uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure uh, interviewing today, mate. And thank you for being on my show. Thanks so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth and please like, subscribe and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. If you want to grow and scale your business, you can reach out to me on any platform to see if we're a good fit. I completely agree with you or do I? The only way you know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So remember to design your growth and results.